Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's event, the GovTech Academy, what city and county attorneys need to know about social media. Hey, this is Morgan Wright. I'm a senior fellow at Government Technology. I'm also the uh, chief technology analyst for Fox News, Fox Business, and Sirius XM on issues around cyberterrorism, cybersecurity. Um, but today, I'm interested, and I'm very excited to serve. This is actually because of, of feedback we got from everybody. We now have the GovTech Academy. So I'm the moderator for today's event. want to thank you for joining us. And just to let you know, this is going to be 90 minutes long. But guys, this is an academy. You're going to get a ton of knowledge bombs that are going to come out of this. So before we begin, just a couple of brief housekeeping notes. Now, a recording of this presentation will be emailed to everybody within 48 hours, so don't worry if you miss it or if you have to leave, you're going to get it. You can use the recording for your reference or pass it along to your colleagues. Now, this is also designed to be interactive. We really want Q&A. We are going to do something a little different this time. Q&A is going to happen after each presenter, so if you have a question for that particular presenter, make sure you get the question in, and then anything we don't cover, we'll try and do a wrap-up at the end, but we're going to try and do the majority of the Q&A after each speaker. So, and down at the bottom, if you want to download the PDF, there's a place down there, um, webinar resources. Just click it. You can download a PDF of all the slides. And also, if you want to shout out on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, just use the hashtag GovTechLive and let people know you're on here. So at the close of the webinar, what we need is your feedback. We have a brief survey. If you can't stay with us for the whole thing, just make sure you fill it out when you leave. But folks, I'm telling you, it was because of your feedback we're now moving to these academies. So it is listened to, and it is very important. So at this time, disable your pop-up blockers. If you have any e uh, any issues, we've got Wade and our crack staff here at ON24 will help you with your technical issues. So and if you have any problems at all, just click Help button at the bottom of the console. So now that that's out of the way, um, well, I'm going to need help. There we go. So uh, today we have these speakers are going to be working with us today. So first of all, um, we have Julie Tappendorf. Now Julie is a equity partner with Ansel Glink in Chicago, Illinois. Jennifer is the local government attorney for Lewis Longman and Walker, and Anil Chavla is the founder and CEO of Archive Social. So folks, this is going to be great. So here's what we're going to do. Um, we're going to just uh, we're going to go through an initial opening presentation by me. I'm just going to give you a quick hit on social media by the numbers. Uh, we're going to then talk about social media and open government. We'll talk about the legal aspects of social media use. The last thing we'll talk about is how to enforce your social media policy and manage risk. And then again, we'll be doing Q and A through the entire time of this. So if you guys are ready, let's get started. I'm just going to give you a brief overview, and it's really called it's social media by the numbers. And there's only three numbers you need to worry about with social media. That it, literally, it's one, two, three. So what's the first number we need to worry about? Well, it's number one, and that stands for the First Amendment. The First Amendment to the Bill of Rights, uh, talking about freedom of speech. We know that social media has been one of the biggest areas fraught with all sorts of danger, all sorts of misinterpretation and misunderstanding. So one of the things we're going to talk about today is what is the impact of the First Amendment on social media? Do you have an absolute right to put everything out on social media? Do you have a policy? Can a policy allow you to delete comments or moderate or block somebody. So we're going to get into a lot of, trust me, First Amendment issues today, which I know is one of the biggest areas of risk that we're going to talk about. Second thing we want to talk about, there are two big areas. Now, in my role as a senior fellow uh, for GovTech and also for the Center for Digital Government, we do surveys uh, biannually. And one of the things we talk about are what are key issues for state and local governments. And without a doubt, every year, two of the key issues are these. The first one is transparency. People want transparency in the operations of government. They want an open government. They want to know how their money is being spent. They want to know what actions you're taking. They want access to notes. So you can see how social media being part of that transparency, it's a great tool, but it can be a, a great hammer against you if you use it incorrectly. So we're going to talk about that. The second thing is accountability. People are realizing that we can have more accountability and quicker accountability through the use of social media. So transparency and accountability are two of the biggest things that people want in, in all of our surveys that we do throughout all the states. These two score always at the top of the list, and I, can, I think you see why for social media it's very important. Now for the third number, and as you saw, the first one had one, the second one had two. So yes, this one is going to have three. And what are those three things? This is what I firmly believe in all the work I've done for uh, Fortune 500 companies. I've come out of the government and private sector and the government. And I, you know, there used to be a thing called people, process, and technology. I think we need to turn this around a little bit, but definitely the first thing is policy. Policy. Do you have a policy? Is it written down? Do you know what it is you want to do? You can't do anything without a policy first. I, I mean, whether it's, and I'll show you at the end, you'll see the fancy toys. If you want to drive and fly fancy toys, what's the first thing you got to do? Sit down and look at the book. 
what does the book say? So do you have written policies? Second thing is, have you done your training? You know, this is fitness dog here. He's, the only way he's going to get strong is he's got to train all the time. Training gives you the right kind of behavior. If you want people to act a certain way, you have to train them to act that way. So make sure you've got policy, technology, and only when you put those two things in place do you get to the fun stuff, like the F-117 stealth fighter. I guarantee, does anybody think that that pilot in that got into that plane without going through a bunch of classroom work, a bunch of policy work, a bunch of training before he actually got to touch the controls of that jet. No, it works the same way with that, whether it's cars or social media. So make sure you have policy, training to get the right behavior, and then and only then should the technology come. So, And then the last thing is, if you're into Facebook and you're doing it this way, I'm afraid you're doing it wrong. So let me introduce now our first speaker. This is going to be fun. I'm going to introduce Jennifer. Then we have a couple poll questions after I introduce her. We're going to ask you to respond to, and then I'm going to turn the floor over to Jennifer. So Jennifer is board certified by the Florida Bar as a specialist in city, county, and local government law, and she holds an AV rating from Martindale Hubble. That means she's been reviewed by her peers and is at the top of the class there. She practices and focuses her practice on local government, public pension, land use, and litigation, and she serves as city attorney, general counsel to several special districts, and and represents many local governments as special counsel, and she also routinely advises local governments in matters related to annexations, public procurement, public construction, collective bargaining, and employment law, ethics, public records, sunshine law, which is a big thing obviously in Florida, and real estate property issues. So before we get into Jennifer's presentation, let's put up the first poll question here. And these, if, the minute I move the slide, uh, then it's going to go to the answer. So make sure you get in an answer. So this first question is, does your local government have a social media page? In other words, Facebook or anything like that. So does your local government have a social media page? And it's very simple, yes or no. Guys, get your answers in because the minute I click, you can't vote anymore. So here we go. Yes, 97%. Wow, that's pretty overwhelming. So pretty much everybody is on uh, social media these days. Now let's go to our next question. Next question is, does your government provide smartphones to its public officials? Um, and don't, no, it's not a contradiction to term smartphones and public officials. Do you provide smartphones to your public officials, any type, you know, iOS, Android? Yes or no? 80% said yes. Wow, that's pretty overwhelming, too. So we had 97% with the Facebook page or something like that, 80% with phones. So, Jennifer, sounds like there's a lot of stuff out there for you to address. So let me turn the floor over to you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, like Morgan just told you, I'm here today to talk to you about social media and open government. And by open government, I'm talking about both the Open Meeting and Open Records Act. And by social media, I'm talking about all forms, everything from social networking, blogging, photo sharing, video sharing, and everything else you can think of out there. Um, uh, here are just some quick stats on social media. And I put these up just to show, I mean, I think everyone on the line will already know that social media is uh, very important in our society. And one of the stats that isn't up here but that I did see and I wanted to let you know is I saw something that said 83% of the world leaders are on Twitter. So when we're talking about social media and we're talking about government, um, we're talking about uh, not only the employees but the public officials that are using it um, on a regular basis. I saw most of you had social media sites. Um, you know, I, I know that oftentimes when my clients are deciding whether or not to have a social media site, one of the things they really enjoy about having a site is that they've got a broad reach. They're, um, you know, a lot of local governments that I represent, they're reaching out to their constituency either on television, through the news media, and having um, social media gets them out there to other demographics that they wouldn't. It also gives them a great distribution for for information. It's fast, it's inexpensive, it's easy, and they feel like the communication that they can put out there has less spin. So, you know, really great benefits to social media, which is I think probably why you see so many of you having those accounts. The cons, <laughs> we're going to talk about some of those today, which is the implication it has on many of the laws out there. I'm going to deal with more of the open meeting and open record laws, but there are also employment um, issues, protected speech. We heard Morgan talk about that earlier, and then copyright. And there are also practical concerns dealing with content control, um, record retention, and then, of course, security. You know, <clears throat> stepping back for just one second, um, 
the, you know, we saw that even here in Florida recently with the unfortunate events that happened in Orlando, that social media was key to that. We saw it being used by law enforcement, by um, by the, the victims um, who were held, as well as um, by the media and to get the information out there as fast as possible and also even to the hospitals and doctors. So it ha it is a powerful tool um, and here are some of the implications <clears throat> in dealing with that. With regard to the open meetings law, many states have open meeting laws. I'll talk to you a little bit about Florida just because that's where I'm based out of, just to give you kind of an example of some of the issues that we're facing. Um, you know, Florida's a sunshine state for many reasons. <laughs> it's not just our weather. Uh, we're a sunshine state because we have a sunshine law that is so broad. It basically extends to any meeting of public officials. And by public official meetings, I mean whether they're formal, informal. I'm just talking about two or more public officials that are basically communicating with each other, be it on the phone, be it in an email, be it standing at a cocktail party. If they're talking about something on a matter that is even foreseeable to come before the board, I have um, an implication of an open meetings issue in Florida. So you can see where this comes into um, effect when you're dealing with social media. You know, if it's, it happens all the time where you'll have, a city will have a Facebook page and there'll be this running commentary on something that came up at the meeting the night before and there'll be a misquote of a public official and they'll feel compelled to correct that. And then lo and behold, later down that chain of comments, you, I've got another public official who's coming and commenting in. So much of this can be handled through uh, social media policy and training, which you heard Morgan talk about. Um, the other issue that comes about is on blogs. You know, a, a lot of cities will look to have a blog because they feel like it's really a great place where they can vet issues with the public and get this discussion going before we're actually at the meeting and so we understand the concerns before walking in the door. The issue um, that arises again is when your elected officials are involved. Um, or, you know, even if it's not the elected officials, if they're appointed officials, if they're sitting in that kind of uh, capacity where they're decision makers, then they're implicated by the open meetings law. The other place that you really see social media issues <coughs> in dealing with transparency in government is in the Open Records Act. I think we're all probably pretty familiar with the um, FOIA, the federal, um, I'm sorry, <coughs> excuse me. Um, we're all pretty familiar with FOIA, and FOIA applies only to federal agencies. It doesn't apply to the records that are held by Congress, the courts, or other um, state and local governments. Most states have their own public access laws. Again, Florida, Sunshine State has one of the biggest, uh, broadest, I should say. And um, so I'm going to use that again as an example just to show you some of the issues that um, we face on a regular basis and, you know, to be contemplated by local government attorneys. Um, in Florida, every person has a right to inspect any public record, and a record is defined so broadly as to inc include anything that is made or received in the transaction of official business. And when we talk about things being made or received, it's even broader than you would suspect. There was a recent case here where the court basically came down and said the public records law extended to documents reviewed by an agency's legal counsel, meaning this legal counsel had actually gone to a secure password protected website to review a transcript. The, the, um, the agency's counsel never held the transcript. It never came to the agency. It was never the only way it was ever viewed. It wasn't copied. There wasn't a screenshot. None of it. It was just viewed by the attorney on the secure password protected website and then that attorney used that information to create a document that was part of a court pleading. And they said, no, because you viewed that document, it's a public record. And I say that because you can see that on um, when you're dealing with social media and you're dealing with going to different social media sites, and if you have public employees that are going to social media sites and using that information, even if they never print it, um, you know, but they're viewing it, they're using it to create uh, documents that – are used in the official transaction of business for the government, those documents they're viewing, those social media sites, can be implicated and be, can be determined to be public records that need to be retained. 
also, <laughs> sometimes you think about a public record and you think about the, the well, there are there are records out there that aren't public records. Um, for instance, if I'm at a government computer and I'm sitting there and I decide, oh, I want to remind my husband he needs to bring milk home, and I send him an email and say, hey, honey, can you grab some milk? Not a public record, even though I'm using a government computer. Obvious, right? But where this comes into play is oftentimes matters that are never public record. And in the social media context, social media posts, comments, things that would never normally be a, pu uh, a public record done on your home machine, at home, after hours, um, can still be implicated in public records because it doesn't matter the machine that you're using. It matters what is that electronic communication. And why this is important, oh, this is just, you know, what I was just talking about. Sorry, I didn't click fast enough. Just saying that it can come in any kind of physical uh, form. You know, in Florida, it's not it's not just because it's a document. It extends to, to documents beyond um, the physical form. So it can be electronic media. But anyhow, the, this comes into play when you're talking about the fact that for most employees, accessing social media occurs as a daily basis. It's no different than, <laughs> than going and brushing your teeth in the morning. Um, a 2013 survey by the Ethics Resource Center showed that 72% of workers access social media on the job at least once a day and 28% spend at least an hour on social media a day. When you look at that compared to what Facebook puts out as its highest traffic hours being midweek between the hours of 1 and 3 p.m., and that their Thursday and Friday engagement is up 18%, and you know that your, your public employees are using it. Not only could, are, could they be using it at home, which could have implications, but they could be use, using your government computers on social media, and the question is whether or not those records they're creating out there are really public records that need to be retained. And I say that, you know, some records are not public records, and they become public records, like the email I was talking about earlier, like the social media post. Well, we see that when, we're, when it comes into workplace investigations. For instance, if you've got a misuse of government equipment or you've got allegations of misconduct, um, ethics violations in how uh, government equipment was used and the time spent on it and or <clears throat> and the <coughs> that unless there's a policy, you know, if, or I'm sorry, if there is a policy that prohibits the use of government machine for social media or for personal use and then you have this allegation or complaint that there is such a use, um, there can be an investigation. And I've had this happen where um, I've had an a employee that um, there were allegations that they were using social media during workplace hours in violation of an existing policy, and there was an investigation into that. And what we found through email and um, through email exchanges, and then looking at their um, website, is it the, or their uh, I'm sorry, their uh, Facebook page, is that that's exactly what had happened? That they had been using it all throughout the day in violation of the policy and. Um, there was a question uh, with regard to disciplinary actions related to that. Um, and you'll see that this also comes about in the sense of employees being out on, like, the Family Medical Leave Act, um, and yet they're posting photos in, of a Mexican vacation at that same time. And there was a case out of Michigan uh, where that was implicated and basically, you know, those records that – you know, those postings that would have been personal postings having nothing to do with the business. It doesn't talk about transacting um, official business, but yet demonstrates the fact that they are in noncompliance with a government policy rise to the level of um, becoming public records. You also see this in harassment cases. You know, a lot of times people think about social media and harassment is only for teenagers. <laughs> you know, and we hear about that through high school students um, and what they suffer, but actually we're seeing it more and more in the workplace, um, seeing it both in the sense that uh, employees are being harassed by fellow employees or by a supervisor. Um, there was actually a California case that dealt with this recently. There's also, we see it in retaliation cases. I know in Tennessee there was recently a case where after the employee was terminated, there were social media posts regarding that termination and the, um, that led to the employee to bring a retaliation action. Um, also, again, hiring practices and litigation, 
many states are moving to try and restrict um, the employer's ability to demand um, disclosure of social media accounts. I can tell you in Florida, probably because we are the Sunshine State, that there was a bill that was proposed and it died with regard to that. Um, so the challenges for, for open government, like we talked about, you know, it's, it, can you obtain and protect that content? How are you going to maintain it? Can you edit the content? Um, you know, when we talk about retention of, of content, there are record laws, um, retention laws. And, you know, in Florida, our Department of State offers guidance. I know it's similarly done in other states that way where they give a guidance as to how records should be kept. The interesting thing is most record retention laws don't deal with the record at hand. For instance, they're not going to say, a social media post. Instead, they're going to talk about the content of that record and they're going to regulate the retention schedule based on that content. And so it really takes someone evaluating each and every um, document to determine its content and where it would fit on the re retention schedule. And then you have, for litigation, you have spoilation issues. You know, if you have litigation going on and you have these posts, are you retaining them in a proper way? And then the question also becomes, okay, you may be able to control your government site, but what about these third-party sites? What about the fact that you have an employee at home who may be posting things that are really public records? Do your employees, are they aware of those public records laws? Do they know how to either, <laughs> do they know how to retain that information and provide it, or are they prohibited from, from using their personal machines in such a manner because there is no way for them to uh, retain it? All issues that need to be addressed and the best way to address it is really in a social media policy. So in sitting down, and I think this was one of Morgan's number three, was, you know, do you have a social media policy? And that's exactly it. There needs to be a social media policy. That you need to think about who is it going to govern. Is it going to govern just the employees? Or are you going to reach out to the elected officials? When you're dealing with, is it going to govern your citizens and how they can post on a government website page? Then you talk about the use. Um, you know, are you going to prohibit use of your own, um, you know, uh, computers and smartphones and for business only? Or are you going to understand that most people are, are mixing business and personal use um, on a regular basis, as we saw from some of the stats earlier? And are you going to have uh, some sort of built-in on how they're going to be able to retain that information? Uh, again, content, and I think um, that one of our presenters later on will, or will address this more, but, you know, if it's a government website or a government Facebook page and you have the content, how is it going to be controlled? Who's going to review it for misuse? Um, are you going to have rules regarding profanity, sexual harassment, et cetera? You know, from a management standpoint, records management standpoint, who's going to be responsible for reviewing the documents, determining whether or not they're public records and retaining them? Um, you know, you may have security issues. Uh, you may have, you know, depending on what you take in, you may have, uh, like, for instance, are your people paying their accounts online and how is that material, how is that information protected? Do you want to have a separate policy or do you want to include that in your social media policy? Um, you know, are you providing notice to the fact on your social media sites that the communications are subject to the Public Records Act? Do you have access for your citizens to see what the social media policy is so they understand the restrictions on that. Um, so there are all sorts of um, kind of information that needs to be both included in your social media policy and then disseminated to your employees, elected officials, and citizens on kind of what the restrictions are, the implications of social media, because with transparency in government, you uh, really, the government's on the hook for the actions or inactions of its employees and um, public officials in failing to comply with the transparency laws. And with that, very quick, <laughs> um, I'll take comments or any kind of questions that you have. Hey, Jennifer, good job. Hey, look, you, you covered a lot of things. And as you and I talked before, uh, you know, during a previous call, um, folks, I used to work 
do some work down at the Department of Justice on information sharing. I can tell you the challenges Florida had because we actually had to work with them to get their law changed to protect information that was being shared for law enforcement purposes to the fusion center. So you folks see that this is a complex issue. Hey, uh, we have a we have a couple questions. Actually, three questions that have come in. So Jennifer, the first one is we in the survey we talked about 80 percent of these folks are providing smartphones. Um, to their public officials. So what is your thought? I mean, I know you asked the question, so do you advise support or against? Do you think people ought to have those? Do you think they ought to have their own phone and be paid for? What's your view of the smartphones? I'll tell you from, um, you know, from dealing with uh, trying to maintain, and one of the things I should have mentioned is maintain not only the data as you would generally see it, but also some metadata and stuff. I find that government-issued smartphones are the way to go. Um, you know, most of my clients will issue it. I know it's an expense, but when you're coming up with public records and transparency and government issues, it's really kind of penny-wise and pound-foolish to do it any other way. Um, what ends up happening is it just causes more problems for the government entities to try to um, obtain the necessary public records that have occurred during the course of business if they don't own all the devices, um, then they're, they're you know, having to seek court orders to get access to items that they would never normally have to if, if it was a government-owned device. Sure. Hey, well, you know, and obviously it's, it's only the number of devices out there. It's, it's just going to get bigger before it gets better. So, hey, we have a, some other questions here, too, real quick. Uh, Nancy Feldman from South Coast Air Quality, she's asking, can an employee be disciplined for negative or critical posts on social media, you know, as opposed to being disciplined for time spent on social media um, or a post, you know, used to substantiate what she says in abuse of family leave or sexual harassment. So, I mean, in your survey there, you talked about a lot of people are spending a lot of time on social media. So can they be disciplined for negative or critical posts, you know, as opposed to being disciplined for time spent on it? Right. Um, I mean, most of the times that I've been involved in a disciplinary action uh, regarding social media, it's been because it's been in violation of a policy, less because it's a, a negative post. That being said, depending on the information that they're providing, um, and I say that because if you have a situation where you have confidential information um, in the middle of litigation um, or in a like a workplace investigation and they're disclosing that information on um, uh, Facebook, then yes, there would be you would be able to potentially discipline that employee for that. Um, you know, merely because they're expressing that they don't <laughs> like something about their job or you know uh, are are having, you know, are having difficulty with their supervisor, um, you're not going to go so far as to discipline them for that. Okay, yeah. And it, this is just a whole new way of water cooler talk. Now it's now it's digital and virtual. So, hey, we have another question exactly. in here from uh, Rafi, Raphael, and I hope I don't butcher the last name, Zeratsian, but uh, he's from Hastings on Hudson Village. Um, he's asking, what do you do if the public harasses elected uh, and officials or an employee on <laughs> Facebook? You know, I haven't, uh, I'll tell you that the, um, while I've had public officials that have their personal uh, Facebook pages and I've had people come in and harass them there such that they take certain measures to exclude those people from being able to post on their uh, Facebook page, um, we have a really restrictive um, ability for people posting on uh the city's page, you know, it's more for information to provide for citizens on most of the cities that I represent rather than uh, going and having the dialogue. Um, but, you know, you talk, when he uses the word harass, that gives me a little bit more of a concern because, you know, is it harassment in the colloquial sense of, you know, they're just unhappy with it, or is it harassment that's really rising to a, a legal level where um, you've got threats where, you know, you need to notify law enforcement or anything like that? No, absolutely outstanding. And in this day and age, we know the power of threats over social media and how it's being used by everybody from terrorist groups, you know, to gangs, to other folks. So it's definitely a serious issue. And just to let you guys know, uh, Julie Tappendorf will be addressing some of the, those additional issues in her presentation. So we've got another question here, too. Uh, we've got room for time for probably one or probably just one more question here real quick. April Adams, town of Mount Pleasant. So how do you comply with retention laws when it comes to social media? Would it not take a lot of, uh, you know, data and money? And I know Anil's going to address part of that, but what's been your advice on people complying with retention laws? Uh, most of the time, what <clears throat> our advice has been is that, you know, we um, we restrict our, um, um, we first of all, we educate our employees and provide them proper training on what the uh, public records law is 
and and therefore how it implicates social media. Um, most of and kind of what the the violations of those um, laws can be. And I and I say that because in Florida, you know, the violations can range from everything from civil uh, civil fines to criminal penalties. And so the the individual has now that they've been trained and on advice of counsel. Um, they understand the Public Records Act. They're generally, I mean, a little fearful, I'll say. And so what we do is we tell them, you know, I mean, they can use their own personal social media. We're not going to regulate that in any way other than to say that we do ask that they not <clears throat> uh, transact official business on their personal sites. And if they do, that they literally take a snapshot. I'll tell you, you know, with text and emails, it's a little it's a little easier to regulate than social media. And of course, with the city's own site, we have great control over regulating that. Uh, public officials, again, most of it we do through our policy and our training. Um, but that's kind of how we've handled it. Well, it sounds great. Hey, well, look, I know you're going to stick around for a little bit, Jennifer, because we'll probably have some Q and A at the end. But first of all, I want to thank you very much. Now, folks, stay tuned because now I get the pleasure of introducing our next speaker, Neil Chavla. Now, Neil's going to talk about enforcing social media policy and actively managing risk. And I'm telling you, folks, the, the more that we see happen, the more compelling this is. You guys are going to enjoy this as well. So, Neil is the founder and CEO of Archive Social. It's the public sector's leading provider of technology, and what they do is they help government agencies archive and manage risk related to social media. Now, our Archive Social partnered with the state of North Carolina in 2010 to launch the world's first open interactive archive of social media, and since then, they've enabled hundreds of government agencies such as the city of Chicago, state of North Carolina, and the world's largest law firm, yes, that would be the U.S. Department of Justice, maintain records of social media for legal protection and public records requirements. They were selected for the prestigious Code for America Accelerator in 2013, recognized in 2014 as a cool vendor in government by Gartner as a leading analyst firm, and honored as a GovTech 100 company earlier this year by Government Tech Magazine. Anil is also co-host of the GovTech social podcast. So before we get into Anil, we actually have now a couple quick more polls. So folks, remember, I'm going to put the poll question up, then we're going to get the answer, go to the second poll question and get that answer. So what is your opinion on social media as a public record? Do you believe that it is definitely a public record by law? Do you think it might be a record, but your activity is not worth retaining? Do you feel strongly that it is not a public record, or you don't know? So it definitely is a public record, might be a record, but it's not worth retaining. You feel strongly it is not a public record, or you don't know. So let's get the first set of results. Wow, definitely. So 56% of you folks definitely agree that it's a public record. Um, some of you think that it's uh, not worth retaining, um, but definitely uh, there's, it's all over the board here a little bit. So that's a good lead in for this next question here. And the next question is, how is your agency currently retaining records of social media? Remember that question we just had um, with Jennifer here? So, you know, about how do you manage and what's your records retention? So are you retaining your records and do you rely or do you, we are not retaining our records and you rely on the networks, in other words, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube? or you take manual captures, screenshots, copy and paste. You use a personal backup tool like Backupify, SocialSafe. You use an automated solution, or you're already a happy archive social customer. So you don't retain them and you rely on the networks. You take manual captures. You use a personal backup tool. You use an automated tool, or you already are a happy archive social media customer. So let's take a look at that. Wow, 66% of you folks are not retaining your records and relying simply on the networks. Anil, I think that's uh, just spot on and uh, leads right into your presentation. So Anil, the floor is yours. Well, Morgan, I absolutely agree with you. This is a perfect transition from Jennifer's presentation. Uh, and by the way, folks, this is a real honor for, for me to participate in this conversation with Julie and Jennifer, two, two recognized legal experts on the use of social media in government. I want to be really transparent with all of you. I do not have a degree in law. I am not a lawyer. Uh, but what I do well is I, I can channel information. I can channel the information that we, we've obtained by working with agencies on this issue, uh, actually trying to enforce policy, actually trying to maintain records of social media, and working with folks uh, that, are, that are in the attorney's offices across the country. So I want to share that with you today. And again, take the baton uh, from, from Jennifer and, and go straight into record keeping, that question that was asked about archiving or, or maintaining social media as a record. Would that cost a lot of money? Would that be really hard? Well, before we get into that, I want to start by giving you some real examples of social media as a record. This poll that we just had was pretty eye-opening. Uh, we, we've actually seen a trend towards 
uh, more and more folks believing that social media is a record in government. Uh, this audience here, uh, I hear you out that about 20% of you felt that while it might technically be a record under law, you're probably not creating records, and the rest of you weren't quite sure. I'm going to start by giving you examples of where social media can create records, and I want to share some real-life examples where agencies have received public records requests that do involve social media content, and they've received other legal requests that, that require the management of social media as a record. And really the point that I'm going to make to you today is that these issues around social media policy, both what Jennifer's talked about and what Julie will talk about, these challenges do come to your social media policy, but actually enforcing that policy uh, is, is challenging, and you need some technology in place. And in, in every aspect of that policy, record keeping does play a role. So I'm going to deep dive into record keeping, talk about the technology there, both for keeping records and then, of course, is enforcing your policy in general. And finally, uh, I will be here to answer your questions as well, and I look forward to, to the questions that you have. So to kick this off, I want to start out with talking about that need to, to archive and to, to keep records of your social media. Again, archiving your social media just like archiving your email, presumably something that your agency already does. Why should you be thinking about archiving now? About two-thirds of you are not archiving your social media. You're relying on the data being on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, and, and Jennifer touched on the public records law. I'm going to come back to that and talk about when social media can generate uh, information that constitutes public record and give you some real-life examples. But let me, let me start with this. If you are currently relying on Facebook and Twitter, that's not the most unreasonable thing because it's just out there. You're hoping it's still be there, going to be there. But it is a dangerous position to be in because the social networks have made no guarantee that they will retain your data. They have made no guarantee to government that they will fulfill your record-keeping requirements. If it's there, it's there, but it may not be. And in Archive Social, we actually conducted a study this year to understand what, what this looks like. Is there actual information loss and decay, or are you okay with the information just being on Facebook? And so we sampled 400 customers across our customer base. Uh, these are all 400 public agencies over the course of one month, January of 2016. And we have technology now that can, for our customers where we're archiving their Facebook content, we can actually detect in real time when content is deleted. And we found that out of those 400 customers in one month, 7,800 records were deleted from Facebook. If you go talk to our customers, the vast majority will tell you that they never delete anything because most agencies know that you should, just, you should just hide content. So where are these deletions happening? Well, sometimes the agency does delete because they, they post a typo or make a mistake, but oftentimes the content is deleted when it comes from a citizen. And, and the entire purpose of being on social media is not to have a one-way broadcast. That's not why your audience will, will follow your Facebook page. It's definitely helpful. But they're there to, to really get to know your city and interact with you and, and, and actually respond back to you, maybe ask a clarifying question, maybe provide you with information about a, a, a pothole or, or a, some other situation. It is a conversation. And so when your citizens respond to you, they can certainly say something to you that would constitute record. And if they're deleting it, you're losing it. In fact, if you go to Facebook's website, there's a website dedicated to law enforcement. And on that page, Facebook says, if you're a law enforcement agency and you need data, you can issue a subpoena to us before it's been deleted. In other words, if it's been deleted, I'm not sure we can help you anymore. That data is going to be lost unless you do something about this. Uh, and again, this is out of 400 customers. Se three out of four, 75% of these customers had at least one deletion. Uh, many other customers had dozens of deletions. We're continuing to track this, and we're seeing customers that in some cases having hundreds of deletions in a month that they're not even aware of. So something for you to think about if you're currently relying on the social networks. There is this thing called information decay. Uh, there's been a lot of research about how information does disappear online, and, and you may not even realize to what extent. Now, all of that's fine if social media is not generating records. So let's talk about situations where social media actually generates records. And Jennifer touched on this, where at the federal level you have FOIA. The National Archives has come out and said that under the, the, the Federal Records Act, social media certainly can constitute a record. Uh, in Florida, very strict public records laws. And the public records law in, in Florida, as Jennifer detailed, uh, describes how social media be can become record. Well, it turns out that virtually every state has a Public Records Act or law or Freedom of Information uh, Act or uh, Open Records Act that is written in almost the exact same fashion as Florida uh, and, the, and, and the federal law, talking about regardless of physical form, social media can constitute record if, if it in any way demonstrates evidence of, of, of business being conducted or relates to uh, sense received uh, information, as Jennifer mentioned, even, even you viewing that information, um, as I've learned, could, could potentially constitute public record. So if you're on social media, the question is, are you doing anything that then falls under that definition of, 
of, of, of con communication sent or received or transacted in relation to the business of the government, and also information that's not duplicated elsewhere. The most obvious example. Now, this is something that's really raw. It's really fresh. Uh, just, just one of the most horrific tragedies that we've experienced uh, in, in our nation's history not too long ago in Orlando. Uh, and many of you go, may, may think, well, let's, not, let, let's let this settle in. But I think this is a perfect point of how valuable social media is for the agencies we work with. When Orlando had the situation, the PD immediately made a decision. They said, we will communicate all updates from this Twitter account. No email, no phone calls. Social media is their chosen mechanism for communicating during this tragedy. Very important information, uh, up-to-date information. And we've seen this not just with Orlando, but with San Bernardino, uh, with the Boston Marathon bombings, all the way back to Hurricane Sandy. Social media is the most effective, efficient way to get information out during an emergency to protect your citizens and to ensure their safety. And of course, that content is important. In an emergency like this, of course, there will be public records requests. And if social media is where you're putting it, then that's the only record of it uh, and it's something that you need to have a record of. And, and Orlando, to their credit, has record keeping in place and is able to do this. So you may, hopefully will never have a, a tragedy of that scale, but you certainly have emergencies and issues that social media can play a role in. So think about that. One of our customers in South Florida uh, recently experienced what's called a duct tape dog incident. You may have seen it. It was international news where this town, it's a town of 12,000 people, had very little social media activity, and this photo went viral of this poor, poor dog with the mouth duct tape. And they generated 24,000 comments in just a few days. And the national media actually made information requests for this information. So things can go viral online. If something goes viral on your social media, it becomes national news. In this case, they were asking what the PD was doing about this animal cruelty. The, the media will request that information. Citizens will, will, will per perhaps provide information to you, again, that can generate unique records that exist nowhere else. And how do you control something that's viral? That's, that's sort of the definition of, of a viral event. And then on a smaller scale, here in my hometown of Durham, North Carolina, where, our, where we're located, uh, there are incidents day in and day out with power outages. In this case, 911 went down, and social media, again, plays a role in, in assisting the citizens. This is a, also a public safety issue of how do you reach 911? Well, they decided to use Twitter to get the information out. And beyond that, every agency uh, at some core level in government exists to serve the citizens. And at social media, you have a direct interface with the citizens. That customer service will generate records. In this case, a citizen's uh, relaying information about a sidewalk that needs to be mowed, and Austin's code department is responding right back uh, and getting some clarifying information. Again, these are conversations that are unique to social media, and based on that content, they can certainly generate records. And I'd, I'd encourage you all to look at your social media. If you are having any type of conversation, if you're putting out any kind of notices during emergencies or other events that are not duplicated elsewhere or where clarifications are provided to citizens, you certainly could be generating public records. So with that, the question then becomes who's asking for them and, and why not just point them to Twitter or Facebook? Well, here's an incident from two years ago where a citizen noticed that uh, Seattle PD's Twitter feeds uh, where they were posting out police incidents may have been delayed or missing information. And this citizen actually made a records request for social media using social media. He said, I want the archives of the Twitter feeds. Please consider this Public Records Act request. Again, a request for social media using social media. Now, Seattle PD did inform the citizen they had to fill out the official public records request form. They could not just tweet it, but, but the request was valid. And Seattle was going to provide their, their version of the Twitter feed so that the citizen could understand if they could, they could trust the information that was still on Twitter. Now, that's a contrived example uh, that's very specific, but every day we're seeing these types of examples happen. And uh, when you have a public records request, it may not call out Twitter or Facebook or social media content, but it may, may, make, may actually umbrella that information. So it may ask you for all notifications of the street closure or all emails and communications. And more and more, social media is, is touching everything you do, and it's likely that a records request like this actually does include your social media. So this is the importance at a high level. These are the types of situations. Now I'm going to share some very specific case studies. I'm actually going to take a quick tour around the United States where we've, heard, uh, where we've had actual incidents with our customer base. These are not national incidents generally, but uh, they are very eye-opening. Uh, starting out in the Northeast, in New Jersey, uh, one of our customers uh, was instructed by an attorney to basically stop all comments from showing up on Facebook. Basically go to that one-way approach. It's something that I, I don't personally recommend but the attorney decided that they didn't want to take the risk of what the citizens might say. And they, this is not something easy to do. You can't just toggle a switch on Facebook, but you can, through a lot of effort, 
filter the comments and, and, and hide them before, before anybody can see them. And so they did this, and a citizen realized that his content was being hidden from Facebook. And he said, what do you have to hide? He actually said, I will issue a public records request once a month for all of your Facebook, Facebook comments until you change this policy. And he followed through. So month after month, he issued this records request. And the officer had to go through Facebook, uh, every, look at everything that is hidden, taking screenshots, hours upon hours, collecting this information and sending it over to the citizen. Uh, and it was, it was such a distraction. Uh, this is the kind of stuff you don't want to be distracted with when you, when you could be serving the citizens. Uh, and ultimately, they employed archiving technology where when the citizen makes this type of request, they say, yeah, absolutely. It, it, it's our law to have these records. We have them. Two clicks, here you go. No problem. Uh, and we've enforced our policy as well. In Florida, we had a situation where uh, a police department shared a scam alert about a local company. Uh, they had gotten this information from a law firm, uh, and the company, of course, did not agree with being called a scam. And so the company complained, asked the police department to remove the postings calling them a scam. They did that, and then the company came back and actually filed a lawsuit. And the initial discovery request requested all postings in which the uh, police department and the city labeled the company as a scam. And that would, of course, include what the city had already been asked to remove. So, again, this is not you wouldn't want to start out this legal case by saying, well, you told me to remove it, so I don't have the record anymore. You have to have those records. And so this city, again, was able to, to, to utilize their archive to produce the information, and they're in a much better uh, footing than they would be if they, they couldn't produce information that they, they were obligated to have by law. And this is not even a public records request. Social media touches everything you do. Uh, and unfortunately, government agencies uh, have and will face litigation. And it's really about how you can weather that storm and, and, show, and have processes in place proactively to protect your agency uh, for when it happens. In central uh, Texas, last year, uh, you all were probably familiar with the floods that hit Texas, the worst floods ever recorded in the history of the state. One of our customers, San Marcos, Texas, among many other customers that we have in central Texas, uh, was hit hit very hard by these floods, and they not only had they only not only used social media again to its credit. Social media was critical for that emergency management. But immediately after the flood, they had the types of records requests that I that I talked about that that were about the city's emergency response, uh, the information that they had put out, and it all uh, involved social media. And they were able to use their social media archive to produce that information. Um, and interestingly enough, they also did an analysis using their social media archives. So they built a disaster timeline. They looked at what all happened, what were the topics the citizens cared about. And they used that archive information for more than the legal purposes, but to really understand what to do, uh, really demonstrating the power of this data. And, uh, and it, was, it was valuable that they did that because just six months after that Memorial Day flood, Texas was hit again on Halloween weekend with a second flood, uh, and, they were, and they were that much more prepared. And so, again, having that record keeping has a lot of roles to it, public records, of course, but also just protecting your city and helping you have the information that, that you should have as a government agency. Now, we're all, almost across the country here in the West Coast, Santa Barbara, PD, California. This is a city that had decided to do a gun buyback program. As we all know, gun, uh, gun control issues are very controversial, and the city had opted to do this. The police department doing their job uh, helped coordinate this event. But when this was posted online on Facebook, it created a lot of conversation and debate and questions. And interestingly enough, the National Rifle Association, of course they have an interest in this topic, uh, issued a public information request for all of that content, including that Facebook content. And Santa Barbara PD had decided to do a free trial of our product. And literally on the third week of the free trial, the request came in from the National Rifle Association. And so without that free trial, if they hadn't taken those three, you know, three weeks, you know, taken that little bit of effort, it would have been a devastating thing for, for the officer to do, to go through all of those thousands of Facebook comments, try to reconstruct those conversations, get them out, not showing if he ha sure if he had everything, and then getting that to the NRA, who has a lot of resources. Um, th that's a very dangerous situation to be in, and we actually published a government technology case study about how important it was for him to have that archive and that record keeping, and how seamless and easy it was by acting proactively to respond to this, nothing ever came out of that inquiry, thank goodness, and they're able to move on, do their job, and continue to use social media to inform the citizens. Uh, and finally, all across the country, we're, we're to the North, uh, Pacific Northwest, and Spokane, Washington, uh, Washington uh, again, Washington is a state like Florida with a lot of public records, uh, case law, and incidents, and Spokane decided to be proactive. They had never had an issue involving their social media. And lo and behold, uh, all they're doing is they're promoting local events like everybody does. And unfortunately, somebody dies, passes away on a kayaking trip. 
and the lawsuit for that death request the city to produce two years of information that related to promoting that kayaking trip. And in Washington, like many states, there is a, a, a time period in which you must respond to fulfill a public records request or you will be fined. And so Spokane also did a government technology case study with us explaining how important it was to have a proactive archive in place so they could re respond to that legal discovery request. So here we are, five examples across the country that explain when social media can, be, can, can constitute public record, be requested as public record, or even be involved in a legal incident, and how having a proactive archive, just like you probably do with your email, uh, can, can really min minimize the pain uh, for your citizen, and of course ensure that you continue to have the benefits of social media. So let's talk about record keeping. This is a question that came up right before this my part of the presentation. Um, it starts with social media archiving. In full disclosure, you can tell by our name. Our name is Archive Social. This is what we do. We are not the only vendor. I want to arm you with some, some general guidelines so that you can evaluate this decision for your own agency. But it starts with social media archiving, having control of this data, not leaving it on Facebook or Twitter. Uh, many states actually in their public records guidelines have now advised agencies to, to, uh, to extract that information or export it from the social networking sites in order to comply with the records laws. So having it out there is not necessarily good enough, and it may, may not even meet the guidelines of your state. How do you do that? What do you think about? Well, first of all, because it's out on Twitter and Facebook, it's not in your control, and there is data loss that's happening, you want to get it as frequently as possible. You want to be comprehensive. This is data that's broadcast in public. Someone else may have the record. You better have the record, too, if you want to be able to tell your side of the story. And it's not just the information you see on the page, but uh, there's more to it. I'm going to have a next slide that talks about metadata. Uh, you want the, the content you get uh, to be as authentic as possible. You want to have a real electronic record. There's case law with email and other types of formats where the, the authenticity has been challenged. A screenshot is something that anybody can take. You could Photoshop anything. And if you're challenged on a screenshot, it may not then be the best. It may not serve the purpose of legal evidence when, when you need it to. So you want authentic content that, you, that can hold up in court. And then context is really interesting with social media. Unlike email and other formats, social media is a living, breathing conversation with rich multimedia. And if you're producing a Facebook conversation from four years ago, how do you reconstruct those thousand comments in a way that makes sense? Um, that's really important. Those are the things to think about as you evaluate approaches. Um, in terms of metadata, here, here's an example. A tweet, maybe 140 characters, but the actual electronic record, if you actually, with technology, reach out to, face, to, to Twitter servers and you ask for this tweet, you will get more than 2,000 characters of metadata information like user IDs and timestamps and location information. And at least two states now have ruled that metadata is a part of the electronic record. So again, having a more complete record is to your advantage in, in this case. Uh, if you're going to invest money and time in, in, in solving this problem. And I also wanted to touch on context. Uh, too many archiving vendors like, in our boat will just focus on storing data and say, yeah, we grab Facebook and we store it for you. Well, what does that mean? Can you actually make sense of it? Do you have complete information? And so in this example, we have on the left two pages of a PDF. Uh, this search actually matched one, uh, two comments. But you can't just export those two comments out and make sense of this. Those two comments need to be recombined into the conversation that they belong to, and then you need to get that whole conversation out if you're going to send this off to somebody so that people can make sense of this and understand that they have a complete record. Um, and so getting that, co that context is really important, reconstructing it, and then having all that multimedia that, that's embedded in there, having it exactly the way it shows up on Facebook is really important. So when you think about record-keeping approaches, screenshotting is not going to get you here because it's just not a viable long-term approach. But there is technology out there that can do this, and I urge you to look at that and evaluate your options. Now, beyond archiving uh, for public records and records management needs in case there's legal discovery, there are other advantages to capturing the social media content and using technology that captures this content. One of those is being able to actually actively enforce your social media policy. A policy is only as good as, as how you enforce it. And so now there's technology, uh, we work on technology like this, where you can actually monitor the content as it's posted on Facebook and Twitter and detect whether it matches profanity filters and alert you so that you can decide if you want to remove it. Maybe it's a racial slur, you want to remove it or hide it. Uh, it can detect if someone accidentally uh, posts their personally identifying information. Maybe they go as far as uh, posting a social security number as we've had in our customer base. But it could be that uh, your police department is asking for a crime tip and the citizens are, are starting to reveal address information about somebody and, it, and that's not really something you want publicly on your Facebook page. Being able to pattern match and alert you, this is the kind of stuff that this technology can do, keep your, keep your presence that much safer. Um, in addition to uh, alerting you for, for policy violations, 
also just allowing you to respond to risks really quickly. So we have alerting technology, for example, that can let you know when anything's being posted about that may be a public safety or an emergency situation, active shooters, things like that. And this is smart technology that doesn't do an exact match, does a fuzzy match, and tries to let you know about anything that you should be aware of, um, even if, if you can't monitor your social feeds all day long. Uh, and then when you get that alert, you get in your email, and you want technology that gives it to you in a way that you can use it and immediately act on it. Uh, and then finally, being able to actually analyze your content and, 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 and identify risks. So one, one, one area of technology that we're experimenting with is sentiment analysis. How positive or negative is the reaction from your audience? And when there are spikes, you probably want to go, go and look at that. Uh, we also have technology around highlighting the people that are posting the most. This technology has helped our customers identify when you have a troll or perhaps an evangelist, but perhaps a troll on your site that keeps posting the same thing over and over again and is really muddying your social media presence and, and maybe even causing problems. So having analysis and monitoring on top of an archive or in a social media management tool can help you actively enforce that policy. So I'm going to close down here uh, just quickly about Archive Social. While we have a commercial offering, uh, we certainly like to work with all of you. Uh, we really want to be a, a resource to you in government. Government is nearly 100% of our focus. Uh, and on that note, we do have technology around archiving and risk management and policy enforcement, and we will provide it at no cost to any agency experiencing a crisis. So if your agency experiences a crisis, um, as we've re recently had happen, and you don't have this type of archiving in place, go to this website and with no obligation, no cost. We will protect your agency. It's our way of, of giving back to the public sector at no cost. All we ask is for your feedback. And we'll, we'll give you 100% free access to our technology to ensure that you have the records for your public records request or any litigation that might result from a, a terrorist attack or an active shooting or a natural disaster or even something going viral. So please check this out, and, and we'll, we'll help you if we can, even if you're not one of our customers. And with that, here's my contact info. Happy to answer some questions. Neil, great job. And look, we do have some questions coming in. Uh, real quick, um, Lindsay Sherman, Florida AG. I'm going to save your question for one of our attorneys. Uh, that one's more directed towards them, but we've had some others come in. So, Neil, obviously we've seen uh, with many incidents lately, there's a lot of things being captured. So how often does Archive Social capture new content? I mean, is it by the second, by the minute? How are you doing these things? Yeah, our, our goal is to get as real time as possible. Um, networks like Facebook are, are real time, and it really depends on the social network. Uh, the principle of Archive Social is that we, we will only archive something if we can get it in native, authentic format from the network. We don't like shortcut records. So what that means, though, is that we're dependent on what the network provides. Uh, Facebook provides it in real time. Other networks, we're continuously polling and monitoring those networks, getting content as soon as we can within minutes. And Anil, you know, you mentioned some of the networks. Can you kind of cover how many different networks um, are there out there? Basically, you know, what are the popular ones, and how many are you covering? Sure. Our, our focus again is uh, practically 100% public sector, so it's all the ones that you see in public sector as most important for your agencies: Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, Pinterest, Flickr, Vimeo, and Google Plus are the networks we cover today, and we are expanding that uh, as agencies come to us with, with the use of other platforms. I didn't hear MySpace on there, Neil. <laughs> uh, it's, just, it's a lonely place for you, isn't it, right now, Maureen? <laughs> uh, hey, no. hey um, there's also some questions, too, about timeliness, right? So um, some folks have been inquiring, too. You're like, some of them are late to the game. Some of them launched things maybe several years ago, like three years ago. So how do you handle that older data if you st start archiving now? Is it still out there? You know, what kind of a percentage of capture can you get? You know, or how much of that can you get even if you start archiving now but you started three years ago? Right, right. This is a fairly emerging issue, and we've really seen the, the tide turn where agencies are, are actively coming to us and we're having to do less education on this issue, but they have been on Facebook for four or five years or Twitter or their sites. Um, our, our, one of the things about comprehensiveness, that, that one of those four pillars I mentioned, is trying to go back and get all the data. We do that with our technology. We go back to the inception of your page and try to get everything that's still available. So that's the caveat. If it's been deleted or lost, it's gone. Uh, there's no way to get it, and if the network limits it anyway, there's no way to get it. But we will get go back, and we've had we've had customers who sign up, uh, and within the first 24 hours of working with us, we have 50,000 records for them because of going back, and that's not something that we even charge for. Wow, that's a lot. And, and folks, keep your questions coming in. Um, we've still got, um, you know, we, we have another presenter coming up, but we want to make sure we get your questions answered. Hey, Neil, you know, this, this is uh, having worked in public sector as well, that's usually people say three things. We like it. 
And then the second thing is, how much does it cost? So let, let's just talk about the cost factor, because you, you are strictly dedicated to public sector, so I know you have a unique model for handling this. Absolutely. And archiving and vendors in general will start at a few thousand dollars a year and beyond, and some, some will charge you for setup fees, maybe going back to get the data. Some may charge you for export fees. I can talk specifically about us, and because we sell a transparency solution, we are transparent with pricing. You can go to archivesocial.com slash pricing. Um, and we, because we work with public sector, we've made it a goal that for 80% of our customer base, the cost needs to be under 5000 annual. Fixed cost, no other fees, uh, because we know that 5000 is often that, that threshold, that discretionary spend. And again, 80% of public agencies are able to, to set this up very easily under 5000 Some agencies are, are, are half that cost, some are, some are more that cost, but that, that gives you an idea. Very good. Hey, um, got a question coming in here from uh, Catherine Lundenberg. Um, can't quite see the whole thing, but I think it's the Office of Legislative Counsel. But she's asking, and I know that this is a this is a big issue as well too. Does Archive Social pick up hidden comments, things that the public can't see? Yes, yes. Archiving technology can get those hidden comments. Um, there are cases where you may also want to remove. I know most agencies uh, are savvy enough to, to to avoid that, but there are cases. In that case. Um, in, our, in our technology, I can speak for our platform, there, there's also the ability to go in there and trigger the archiving and say, before I get rid of this, let me make sure that the archive has the record. So you so certainly want to protect that content, even if it's no longer going to show up on your page. Okay. Now, we've got a, folks, we've got a lot of questions here. Anil, um, appreciate it. Um, you did a great job. We still have some questions there, but we're going to have to move on to our next person now. So thanks very much. So now... I have the pleasure of introducing Julie Tappendorf. Now, Julie is an equity partner with Ansel Glink out of Chicago, Illinois. And what she does is she practices in the areas of social media and local government law. Now, she's published a number of books and articles on social media and local government topics, including social media and local governments. Uh, it's out of ABA Press, uh, among others. Now, she's a frequent speaker at local and national conferences on social media and government issues. She's also regularly conducts, as we talked about, what's important, employee training on legal implications of government social media use and has drafted numerous social media policies. Now, she currently serves as village attorney for several villages, including Gilberts, Lindenhurst, Campton Hills, Herrick, and Wadsworth, and city attorney to Pana. She's an adjunct professor at the John Marshall Law School and author and moderator of the local government blog, Municipal Minute, where she writes about local gov issues. And prior to her law career, and thank you for your service, Julie, she served in the U.S. Army Military Intelligence Branch as a Korean cryptologic linguist, having many friends who've gone through Wachuca and uh, MI work. Appreciate your service in that area. So before we get to Julie, though, Let's talk about a couple questions that we want a, another poll question again. Answer the question. We'll go to the results. So do you have a social media policy? And if you don't know, say no. But if you do know, say yes. So we don't have a don't know on this one. So do you have a social media policy? Yes, no, or I don't know. Just use no. Let's see what everybody said here. 81% said yes. That's actually outstanding. I'm surprised. Sometimes it tends to be low, uh, lower sometimes, but that's actually great. So let's talk about the next question here, which is, let's try. I'm sorry. I thought there were two more questions here. My, my mistake. <laughs> hey, but Julie, hey, uh, you, know, you get going with these things and you're moderating. It's, you know, it's like a dashboard here. So, hey, but Julie, but uh, actually there's a lot of things teed up. And when we get done, I have a question for you um, about uh, uh, e-discovery that somebody brought up. So, but, but for now, the floor is yours. Great. Thanks, Morgan. Um, appreciate everyone sticking around. Uh, this has been a great session for me as well. I'm learning a lot. We always, uh, it, we, even when we practice in this field, there's always something new to learn. Um, so I want to dive right in to kind of the, the summary of the end before we start. So you get, kind of get a flavor of what I'm going to be talking about. So I like to start with take-home tips. What are you going to learn from the next 15 or 20 minutes? First, social media content may be a public record. I use the terminology or I use the term may because it really depends on your state. But I think for the most part, at least in my research for the social media book um, that the ABA published, is that most states have expanded their definition of public record under open records and records retention laws to include pretty much anything electronic. Um, certainly electronic communications um, should, for the most part, include social media posts and communications as long as they relate to public business and, and meet the rest of the definition. 
So certainly there's no question in Illinois that social media content is a public record if it is discusses public business and all of that. Um, for those of you in other states, I think this is an important issue. Take a look at your, at your statutes. I suspect that the um, definitions are broad enough to include this type of um, electronic communication. Two, be careful not to censor comments, and you've heard from the other speakers about the First Amendment, um, and we'll talk about that. This is an area where government social media is just different. I'm on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, on a variety of different social media platforms. If somebody writes something on my Facebook wall this morning that I don't like, um, in this political season, so I'm sure you've seen stuff that you don't like. I can hide it, I can exit out, delete it, whatever it is. If you're the government and you operate a social media um, page, you're subject to the First Amendment, and you are going to be more restricted on the type of posts, comments, content that you can um, that you can delete or get rid of on your social media site, and we'll talk about that. Three, create content to avoid copyright violations, and we'll talk a little bit about use of photographs, videos, and, and other content from other sites and, and that you find on the Internet. Um, the best way to avoid a copyright violation, and this is something to talk to your clients about because they probably aren't aware, mine weren't, that just because it's on the Internet doesn't mean it's free to use. Um, create your own content. If you need a picture, take the picture and post it yourself. There's no question that you own it, um, as opposed to maybe using a photograph from someone else's site. Four, don't put the intern in charge, and I'll give you a, um, a story about how that can go wrong. Um, five, adopt a social media policy, and we'll talk a little bit about what might go into that. And then six, and this is um, true across the board, almost every single day when I'm reading stories and doing a little bit of, of uh, research for my blog on social media activities, um, I find that number six is true. Not employees may behave badly, but they will. And if you haven't had a, an experience in your own community yet, you probably will. Um, they will do something. An employee um, of the city, the county, will, will do something on social media, and it doesn't have to be on the government site. It doesn't have to be um, on their uh, job during their work hours. It can be entirely private that reflects badly, that impacts um, something uh, professional and something official with the government, and you're going to be asked, what can we do about it? So we'll talk about that. All right. So we spent a lot of time already on public records. I don't want to um, spend any more uh, significant time on this. When I do these trainings, we do talk about what might be um, subject to release under a Freedom of Information Act, um, what might be subject to record retention laws. You've already heard from everyone else. Check your state laws. Um, check your archiving requirements. In Illinois, we, the State Archive has actually published guidelines on what type of social media content is required to be retained for governments. So we, we, I feel pretty fortunate in Illinois that we've got some really good guidance. So if you practice in Illinois, um, check that out. If you practice in another state, it's something you're going to have to take a look at. Find out what those record retention requirements are. Make sure that your clients and your communities are complying with that. Open meetings, this is actually something you, you need to advise your um, members of public bodies about because I know it, in my uh, practice with my elected officials, they had no idea. Um, and, and this sort of, for those of you that have been practicing for a while, this sort of harkens back to when email first came out um, and text messages. And government officials were emailing and text messaging like crazy about public business. And I, I don't think at the time any, any of them really thought, hey, I might be violating these open meetings laws that prohibit me from meeting um, with a certain number or whatever your laws are um, outside of the formal and, and noticed and public is invited meetings. Uh, so just as we all now know that texting and emailing could trigger these open meetings laws, social media communications are going to be subject to the same analysis. So for um, those of you that practice in my state, and I know there are a lot of laws that are very similar, if a, a certain number of members of the public body are communicating in, in what the 
sort of called a contemporaneous manner, on social media. So maybe they're on a Facebook page and they're talking about public business and back and forth and back and forth. They could be triggering um, the meeting requirements notice in public hearing. And in Illinois, at least, these are criminal penalty statutes. So making sure that your elected officials understand that their activities on social media are, could be subject to the same restrictions as emails and texts and, and all of the other kind of electronic communications. It's an important um, tip for advising your clients. All right, I said at the beginning the First Amendment's one of the bigger issues, so I want to spend a little bit of time on this. And the question that came up, I think, when governments were just getting started in social media was, are these postings on social media sites, whether it's the government content, so posting about, um, but more importantly, the responses, so the, the comments, the, the posts from members of the public or employees, are they protected by the First Amendment? Um, and again, I mentioned social media activities by governments just different. You know, we, we've, we're subject as government officials and government bodies to different requirements and, and restrictions in the law than private individuals or organizations. So we have to be much more careful. This is one of the biggest, sort of the um, one of two uh, most common questions and issues that come up in my practice, the other being employee use. So I'll give you, I like to give a couple of examples, a couple of don'ts. Here was one of the first um, cases that was filed in this area about First Amendment and social media, and involved um, the Honolulu Police Department. In this case, the Honolulu Police Department operated its own Facebook site, and they had, um, you know, posted about various things, and they had uh, residents, individuals posting negative comments on that page about individual officers, about the police department, that sort of thing, and they were routinely deleting those. Well, um, some savvy person took a screenshot and filed a lawsuit saying that the uh, police department and the city and county violated their First Amendment rights by removing and censoring their speech. Now, this case it, fortunately for, I guess, the, the city and county, maybe not so much for lawyers who wanted to know how a court would look at this, the case settled before we got a ruling on the issue of is social media, a government social media page, uh, page or site, a um, public forum, and what type of public forum would it be? Now, in this case, the plaintiffs were arguing it was a traditional public forum, um, I, I, you guys all know the, the law on public forum. You know traditional public forum. It, it's been, uh, it, I mean, sort of over many years of Supreme Court decisions, uh, we talk about sidewalks, we talk about parks, you know, traditional. And, and it's hard for me to, to buy into an argument that social media, which has only been around for a dozen years or so, is a traditional public forum. But I do think for, for those of us that represent cities and, and counties, we, we need to think of it as that more than likely it's going to be some sort of public forum, designated, limit, limited, something. It's probably not going to be considered government speech, um, which allows us sort of in our clients the, the, the most control over um, the site and the speech. Uh, websites uh, are often thought of as government speech, but the reason in those decisions that courts have said that is because the website is static. It's a one-way communication. The government controls the page, and they control the message. It's almost impossible to control the message on social media. If you set up a Facebook page, people are going to be able to comment. They're going to be able to post. They're going to be able to, to uh, put photographs and, and, and memes and links and all sorts of things. Um, and you've opened it up for that because that's social media. It's interactive. So I think we're going to see decisions come out, I think, in advance of getting a case in your jurisdiction. The safe approach is to look at it sort of as a limited or designated public forum, kind of like a city council meeting. We, we open it up for public comment. We have to allow people to criticize us, but we can control disruptive, hateful, and that sort of thing. Um, so it cost the Honolulu Police Department uh, some money to settle that case. Here's another example, and I like to just throw this one out. This is from my own um, state. This is the city of Peoria. Here's a parody site. 
and you know that parodies, satires have some First Amendment protection. Um, this was a Twitter site set up at Peoria Mayor. This one cost uh, the city of Peoria $125,000 uh, lesson to the city. They tried to shut down the Twitter site. They ordered it shut down. Um, and the court said, you know, these are protected activities. As long as it's very clear that it is a parody and a satire, that someone's not trying to misrepresent that they actually are the mayor, that it's protected speech. How do you, um, how do you uh, avoid a situation like this? I encourage you um, to talk to your clients about verifying their pages. Facebook, Twitter all have verifications, which can be used by governments you know, the little blue check mark um, that shows that it is the official site. Um, people that are aware of what that means will know when they're going to your site as opposed to some parody or, or uh, misrepresentation of a site. Now, what, what can or should you do? Now, most of you already have social media policies in place. I'm assuming they include a comment policy, as they should. What What's important about the comment policy is that you're providing the public, the users of your site, the visitors, with notice of the type of posts, comments, um, uh, content that isn't going to be tolerated, that is going to be removed. Um, I like to have those policies, even if it's just the terms of service, just a list of the, the banned type of activities, posted directly on the site. In Facebook, you can use the About site or the About page and just have a list of, of the type of comments. And here's just an example. Um, I, I wouldn't encourage you just to take this and use it because all jurisdictions are different. This is an example of what one of my clients has put in place, and it prohibits certain types of comment. You'll notice when you read this that it doesn't say um, it prohibits critical um, uh, or negative comments about, about the government because you shouldn't be prohibiting that. Um, just as somebody can come to your city council meeting and say, hey, I think you're doing a bad job, they can say it on Facebook or on Twitter, but it prohibits the kind of speech that isn't um, necessarily protected. So threats, um, violation of laws, um, compromising security or safety, um, promoting businesses. You don't have to allow people to uh, post links to, to restaurants or their, or their Tupperware business or their websites or anything like that, I caution you if you do prohibit um, or delete commercial type that you be very consistent with that so you're not picking and choosing, oh, we like that business, we don't like that one. Um, and, and that's the First Amendment issue, that, that it's okay to ban commercial advertising on your site because the purpose of the government site is to disseminate information about government business, right, not private business. But if you're going to do that, make sure it's consistently enforced. Now, copyright issues, I mentioned this at the beginning. There's no blanket government exception to copyright laws, and just because you find it on the Internet um, does not mean that you can use it. Um, there are fair use um, uh, uh, regulations and policies that allow you to, to use some materials, but I think we need to advise our clients to be careful about just um, taking photographs and videos and, and content that we find elsewhere and pulling it and using it on our sites. Whenever you can, create your own content. Take and use your own photos. It's almost always the photographs that get people in trouble. I like to use this example because it's lawyers, and usually when I do a training, people like to see when lawyers are behaving badly as opposed to government officials. Here, a uh, lawyer set up their own uh, website, and they took stock photos from around the Internet to use those. Um, uh, there are programs out there where, where these photo companies will do searches, and they find when you use their photographs. And so they sued the guy um, under copyright laws, which have huge penalties. Um, $150,000 per instance was the damage. He ended up settling it. Again, just because it's out there and on the Internet doesn't mean it's free to use. Um, so making sure that, that all of your clients understand that. Um, use of citizen photos, I, I just want to touch on this. This is a, a, a two-part issue. The first is, um, you know, can I take the photograph? Um, and usually the answer is yes, that if somebody is participating in a government event, let's say movies in the park um, or some other type of uh, community days event, and you've got somebody out there with their cell phone taking pictures, uh, they're out in the public, 
there, there's no expectation of privacy out at one of these events. So you, you can certainly take their photograph. The question is, is it okay to use it? This is usually less of a legal issue than it is um, a political issue or a community relationship issue. Uh, I, I'm always advising my client, listen, I'm not telling you to over-lawyer this. I don't want to over-lawyer this. You have 150 people coming to the um, Movies in the Park event. You are not going to get a signed photo release from every single person there. It's not reasonable. So what do you do? You use whatever reasonable um, you know, way to get either permission, consent, or, or even just a, a no objection that you can get that it's okay to upload these pictures to your Facebook page. We have, I represent a lot of park districts, we've had some um, questions and concerns um, raised by parents when somebody in the summer camp program, one of the camp counselors, has posted pictures of the kids in the program on their personal Instagram account, and the parents are very uncomfortable with that. How do you deal with that? You know, in a summer camp program, you have a registration form. You probably already have a photo release in there that they're signing as part of that. Make sure it's up to date. Make sure it talks about um, social media sites. Because most of them don't. They haven't been updated in a while. And that's where you get in some issues. People may have no problem with you taking a picture and putting it in their newsletter, and they may have a real problem with it being used on social media. Um, and, and, you know, we all be surprised by that given how many people uh, post pictures of their kids every five minutes. But there are parents out there or just individuals that don't want to be um, their image to be uploaded. So we use releases when they're, when they're appropriate. You know, it's in a registration form. If it's an activity that's not um, something that you require people to sign up for, have a notice. We have these notices at public pools now where it just says that, you know, by entering this and, and participating, your picture may be taken and may be used. So, and that's a real simple thing to post or to have temporarily or put it in your um, marketing materials. So have the brochure or the newsletter that goes out about an event just say, you know, by um, coming to this event, you, you understand that we may take your picture and we may be posting it. And then people can opt out. Um, and most won't, but at least you've provided notice. It, it, that's where you usually get into some issues. So the last um, issue I want to run through is the employees behaving badly. Here are some of the stats. And, and the stats are on the job, so d using the Internet while you're working. If you're spending seven and a half hours on Candy Crush in an eight-hour day, you can be disciplined for that. The other is um, the issue of off the job, so your personal, and that's usually where I get called. Um, that's the, the little more difficult one. Um, here's just a couple of great examples. This one, I wish I could get fired some days. It would be easier to be at home than to have to go through this. In this case, a uh, coworker saw this, reported, which is always what happens. Coworkers always rat the employees out. This individual was terminated, um, and the termination was upheld. Individual gripes about your job, just complaining about your day, is not protected. Now, obviously, if you have a um, collective bargaining agreement, if you're not in an at-will um, employee situation, that's totally different issue. We're talking about an at-will employee. Just griping about your job or your boss is not protected activity. Another one, candidate for a job, um, posted this about a new job, um, hating the work. I could have sort of jumped out. Her prospective employee saw this and revoked the offer. Not protected here. There was nothing here in this um, statement that was in any way protected. This is a recent one that Chipotle, um, there was a uh, tweet by a Chipotle um, employee that got the employee fired. In this case, um, the NLRB, which doesn't apply to local governments, but, but sort of sets a precedent for those local opinions, um, actually uh, overturned the termination by the employee and struck down the uh, social media policy because they, the core or the NLRB found the social media policy too broad in that it, it prohibited disparaging and derogatory speech. So you've got to be careful. If you have a social media policy, make sure that you know the type of speech that, that is allowed. Um, and last, just the disciplinary, the, kind of summing this up, employees can discipline employees for excessive use at work, individual gripes, 
um, illegal or improper, and then violations of the policy, those are not protected. Here's where you've got to be careful. Protected concerted activities, so union, water cooler speech, be very careful about um, that sort of because it's no different than the water cooler. It's the virtual water cooler. Matters of public concern, so whistleblower type. And then political or other protected speech. You should not be disciplining for those types of issues. Um, and then social media policy, we kind of talked about um, making sure you've got that, make sure you've covered a lot of the issues that we talked about. And then I leave, I leave you with my best practices. You can read these at your leisure because I want to make sure we leave time for questions. Both professional and personal, the humor sometimes fails. Is almost, uh, it always gets somebody in trouble. Um, and we'll jump right to questions, Morgan. <laughs> Julie, thank you. Hey, actually, yeah, it's uh, it's when people think they're being funny. That's when it usually doesn't happen. Hey, um, we've actually had some questions come in. One of them I want to get to right away. And folks, don't worry. Everything everybody's talked about today, Julie, Jennifer, Anil, all of that information is available in a download of a PDF at the bottom of your console. Also, we're going to send you a link out to this. So if you didn't get it down or write it down, don't worry, we're going to get it out to you. Hey, but uh, Julie, this one was an interesting question, more kind of a philosophical thing, but Lindsay Sherman, uh, Florida Office of the Attorney General, uh, her comment was, but it's followed by a question about your thoughts. She, she says she feels as though public records is being treated as e-discovery or electronic discovery. If a piece of paper falls behind the filing cabinet and you miss it, you aren't held responsible. But it seems that due to the quick and easy accessibility of social media, you are almost kind of like a, one is there was no way to find it, you couldn't find it, but the other one is you should have found it. What's your thoughts about that? It, has, this changed, uh, has this changed the game a little bit in uh, electronic discovery? I, uh, yes, I think it has, and I think that there is – especially in e-discovery, for those of you that, that litigate and have to turn over all of the electronic records, there is sort of this heightened thought that, um, that governments, there's so much more public records. I mean, think about if you had to pick up a phone and talk to somebody, there's really no record to that. There's nothing to provide. Now we use email, um, social media, chat, instant message, all of those sorts of things, and we're creating records that may not have existed before. And once we've done that, then we've, we've walked into this new obligation. So I, I think that's a, that's a good um, summary of kind of how things are going. Absolutely. And, you know, you were mentioning memes and links, you know, and uh, bears, oh my, you know, lions and tigers and bears. But uh, speaking of links to other sites, it sounds like you're saying you can ban links. You were talking about advertising and things. You know, okay, so can they ban links? Is there any repercussion from banning those types of links? Sure. And, and what, in fact, many of my clients have banned, um, it prohibited as part of their comment policy, links to any um, outside third-party sites or content, um, it, it, you know, just as part of the policy. And if somebody does post it, they delete it. Again, I'm always very careful and cautious um, to say, if you're going to do that, be very consistent in enforcing it, that we're not going to allow any links to any other sites. So just because somebody posts a link we actually really like, we better not just leave that and then delete everything else. Right, yeah, that, because that, in a sense, that would show some favoritism. You know, somebody's going to get worried about that. Hey, April Adams, Town of Mount Pleasant. Uh, going back to the question we were talking about photographs and citizens, she says, Julie, you do not suggest using photographs, citizen photographs then, or do you suggest just giving credit? I, two different issues, and, and it was sort of running quickly. Number one is photographs that you find on the Internet, not not ones that you've taken of people at an event. So a photograph of a park or trees or some, something else that somebody else has taken and you then use. That's a different issue, and I, and I would say, you know, unless you have permission um, from the, the photographer or something like that. So that's, that's different than citizen photos. So you're at an event and you're taking their pictures. And I think in that case, it's more of a a um, consent, not an ownership issue, because you've taken the picture yourself, but are they okay with you posting it online? Right. Hey, um, guys, we're getting down to probably have time for one or two more questions, but this is a good one that just came in from Josh Devine. I believe it's Tennessee Bureau of Investigation, but I can't read the, read the last thing. But he's got a good question, since this is the political season. How does political speech on social media match with the Hatch Act? In other words, is it protected speech for employees to endorse a political candidate on social media if they're not allowed to wear a candidate's shirt in the office, for example? 
Yeah, and we, I've dealt with that a couple of times, and I think that you've got always have to be careful to check your own. We have a state law in Illinois that prohibits the government from using any of its resources property to advocate a, a candidate or any kind of campaign. Um, so for us, it's a little easier because we, in Illinois, we just say we're not going to allow any political speech on the government site, so it's prohibited under the Illinois Prohib Prohibited Political Activities Act, where we don't want to be seen from the government side of using our resources to look like we're endorsing somebody. So no political speech at all. Um, Hatch Act, a little different. You may have your own state laws about it, um, but be careful because there's, there's political speech being protected. We know that it's protected under the First Amendment, but then there's also it's the government site. So certainly political speech by a government employee on their own sites is something you don't want to get involved in. But a candidate posting on the government speech, I would say just check, check your own statute. I know in Illinois, I feel comfortable advising my clients, go ahead and prohibit it, and it's to protect yourself, the government, from um, looking like you're endorsing a candidate. Got it. And look, on that great note, um, Julie and everybody, we're going to have to stop it here. Look, there, there's still quite a few questions there. We're sorry we can't get to them all, but we have to be respectful of our 90 minutes here. So first of all, I want to thank Jennifer Cowan. I want to thank Julie Tappendorf and, the, and Neil Chavla for uh, being a part of this, folks. Now, um, don't worry. Like I said, you'll get all of this information. We'll be sending out an email with a link within the next 48 hours. You're going to get a link to everything. And obviously, we want to thank our sponsor for this, for this uh, GovTech Academy session which is Archive Social. So folks, um, please give us your feedback before you exit today. Make sure that you click on that survey, that you fill out that survey. This is, what, this is the reason why we ask this, because this academy today is the result of user feedback. They wanted more depth, longer sessions, so we're giving that to you today. We want to thank everybody for being on. We want to thank you for attending um, today, and we look forward to seeing you very soon on yet another government technology event. So everybody, uh, stay safe today and I look forward to hearing your comments back. Thank you very much.